Okay, Excellencies, distinguished experts, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We are ready to continue our conference with the second plenary session entitled The Role of Civil Society Organizations in Ensuring Third Party Responsibility, Perspective from Global and Regional Voices. I would like to welcome our distinguished, distinguished speakers for uh, this afternoon who form the most diverse, and I would say also uh, gender balance um, panel of, uh, of the conference. As in this morning panel, we will first hear about our speakers and then I will open the floor for questions and comments from participants. We will also have a brief recess with a coffee break at 4 p.m. on clock and I would also like to remind our speakers to stay within the seven uh, minutes uh, time limit say by the organizers so that we have enough time for uh, discussion. It is now my pleasure to present to you our first speaker this afternoon, Mrs. Sama Sisei, a staff attorney at the U.S. Center for Constitutional Rights, CCR. She specializes in international human rights and challenging in human immigration policies and abusive police practices. Prior to CCR, Ms. Cissé worked at Equal Justice Wars, where she provided legal representation on immigration matters. The presence of CCR in this event is important as the organization has been active domestically in advocating for a ceasefire and preparing throughout legal work on plausible acts of genocide in Gaza before the South Africa versus Israel case at the International Court of Justice. Mrs. Say, you, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. As the chair stated, my name is Thamas Sisse, and I'm an attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. The Center for Constitutional Rights is a legal and advocacy organization based in the United States. We have a long history of challenging the Israeli government's violations of international law related to its illegal occupation of Palestine and the United States government's support that enables Israel's violations. This work includes litigating to protect the free speech rights of advocates for Palestinian human rights in the US and supporting the International Criminal Court's investigation into war crimes and crimes against humanity committed on the territory of Palestine. In response to the Israeli government's actions after October 7, the Center for Constitutional Rights joined other experts and legal organizations in issuing urgent warnings to the US government of the unfolding genocide in Gaza, what many have termed the ongoing Nakba. Despite these warnings, the United States is failing to uphold its legal obligation to prevent genocide. And President Biden and other high level officials are actively aiding and abetting the Israeli government's genocide of the Palestinian people. As we've heard this morning, since October 7th, the Israeli government has killed over 30,000 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, including over 13,000 children and injured more than 75,000. These are not just numbers. There are faces, stories, names, hopes and dreams behind these numbers. Numerous Israeli officials have expressed clear genocidal intentions and deployed dehumanizing characterizations of Palestinians, including calling them human animals. At the time this is going on, what has the United States government done? They've continued to express unwavering support for Israeli actions. These statements of intent, when combined with mass killings, causing serious bodily and mental harm, and the total siege, siege and closure, um, creating conditions of life to bring about the physical destruction of the group, including mass starvation, mm -hmm. reveal evidence of the crime of genocide. Genocide is the gravest of crimes under international law. Under international law, there is no justification for genocide including self-defense. Yet the United States continues to offer the support to Israel. 
and government officials consistently repeat the support um, and back it up with financial, military, and political support, even as mass civilian casualties escalate and the genocidal rhetoric continues. Therefore, in November 2023, the Center for Constitutional Rights and Co-Counsel brought a lawsuit in the United States federal court on behalf of Palestinian human rights organizations, Al Haq and Defense for Children International Palestine, along with individual Palestinians in Gaza and the US, against US President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, and Secretary of Defense Austin for the United States failure to prevent and complicity in the Israeli government's unfolding genocide against the Palestinian people in Gaza. The lawsuit asked the court to declare that these US officials have failed to prevent genocide and are aiding and abetting genocide and order an end to US military and diplomatic support to Israel. The lawsuit also seeks an emergency order to prohibit any further US military and diplomatic support, including the sales of fighter jets, munition, and other um, weapons to Israel while the case is being considered. On January 26 of this year, the same day that the International Court of Justice issued its ruling that Israel's acts and omission in Gaza are plausible violations of the Genocide Convention, a federal court in California held a hearing for our lawsuit. The hearing included legal arguments, but most importantly, it included live testimony from Palestinians, including Palestinian Americans, about the scale of destruction in Gaza and the impact on their families and communities. We believe that this was the first time in history that Palestinians were able to affirmatively testify in a US court about the Nakba and the harmful impact of the US support for Israel's occupation and bombardment of Palestine. Some examples of testimony that were given um, one of our plaintiffs, Dr. Omar Al Najjar, a 24 year old physician, gave testimony from a hospital in Rafah about the mass displacement and deaths he witnessed. We also had uh, an expert, scholar, and historian of genocide and the Holocaust, William Shabbas, who gave testimony identifying features of the Israeli government's rhetoric and military response as signs of genocide. On January 31st, the federal court found that Israel's assault and siege on the Palestinian people in Gaza plausibly constitute genocide, stating, quote, both the testimony of the plaintiffs and the expert opinion proffered at the hearing on these motions, as well as statements made by various officers of the Israeli government, indicate that the ongoing military siege in Gaza is intended to eradicate a whole people and therefore plausibly falls within the international prohibition against genocide. Despite these findings, the court said it lacked jurisdiction or the power over the US president's conduct of foreign relations and could not order an end to US military and diplomatic support to Israel. Uh, we disagree, obviously, um, with the court's decision and we appealed the decision in March with briefs of support from legal scholars, former military leaders and diplomats, civil and human rights groups, and non-governmental organizations. There is a hearing scheduled for June 10th for a court to hear the appeal, and we hope that the court will do the right thing. Um, over the last few months, we've heard the US government try and shift its liability in the situation by talking about humanitarian aid and trying to ensure that humanitarian aid is getting to Gaza. However, while they are pushing this narrative, they continue to issue weapons, warplanes, munition to the Israeli government. So we say that the United States is still liable. As a third party, the United States has a legal obligation to stop and not further this genocide. And instead of using their immense influence over Israel to end the sales of weapons, they continue to further the killing and destruction that's happening in Gaza. So we plan to do everything possible to continue to hold them accountable to this obligation. Thank you. I thank Mrs. Say for her valuable presentation and look forward to the discussions on the domestic initiatives 
and advocacy in the United States, particularly in these challenging political times. The second panelist is Mrs. Yamin Ahmed, the Director of Human Rights Watch United Kingdom. Ms. Ahmed advocates in her current role of the United Kingdom's foreign and domestic policies to be consistent with human rights, including those of Palestinians under Israeli occupation and blockade. She is a well-known human rights commentator and regularly appears in broadcasts like Al Jazeera and the BBC. Thank you for joining us today, Madam. You have the floor. Thank you very much. As has been noted, my name is Yasmin Ahmed and I'm the UK Director of Human Rights Watch. Thank you to your excellencies, the committee, and to all those who are present today. Human Rights Watch has been documenting for decades the abuses and crimes that have been happening in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. And we have, alongside that, been advocating for change, both in Israel and around the world. Today, we are here at one of the principal seats of the United Nations, an institution built to prevent and respond to situations of mass atrocities. And yet we are now in the sixth month of an ongoing atrocities in Gaza. And after decades of crimes, including apartheid, being inflicted on the Palestinian people by Israel. And where are we? Most of the international community stands at best impotent and at worst complicit in these crimes. Let's just stop to remember. Between October the 7th and March the 12th, over 30,000 Palestinians have been killed. Over 70,000 Palestinians have been injured. 72% are women and children. That's twen over 20,000 Palestinian women and children. As we sit here today in Geneva, Gaza is literally starving. Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war in violation of its international obligations and in direct contravention of the ICJ's provisional measures. The ICJ being the apex UN court. As we have heard, crimes against Palestinians in the West Bank are accelerating at an unprecedented rate as well turning the so often symbolic reference to a two-state solution dead in the ocean of the destroyed Palestinian future. But this six against a backdrop of decades of crimes against humanity, of apartheid and a persecution and other crimes inflicted on the Palestinians by Israel. We also must remember today the hostages who are being held against international law and those who were subjected to crimes on October the 7th. But let's be very, very clear. The atrocities that are being inflicted against the Palestinian people in Gaza today would not be happening if it were not for the provision of arms, military equipment, diplomatic cover and other forms of support by third states, including some of those who claim to be the leaders of the rules-based international order. The very foundations of that order are shaking beneath our feet due to this hypocrisy and the clear double standards. As my colleagues of Adamir, PCHR and others have said, this moment is not only about the Palestinian people, but about the legitimacy and survival of the entire rules-based order. But unfortunately, the complicity did not start in 2023. Countries, including the United Kingdom in particular, played a direct role by virtue of being a mandate holder in the dispossession of the Palestinian people from their homeland in 1948. This heavy historical responsibility should weigh on the conscience of states like the United Kingdom. 
and serve to amplify the significance of the UK and other states' responsibilities under international law. Unfortunately, to date, the United Kingdom has failed to discharge its responsibilities and comply with its obligations, and in fact has consistently attempted to block accountability of Israel for its crimes, including at the ICC and the Commission of Inquiry established by the Human Rights Council. The crimes that we are seeing today are a direct result of the cloak of impunity that has been provided to Israel over many decades by third states. As we have heard, states and state officials have an array of obligations under international law to not facilitate, contribute, or otherwise be involved in international crimes under the laws of state responsibility and specific conventions, as well as customary international law. In the context of arms transfer, they also have ob obligations under relevant domestic and international conventions when there is a clear risk that arms and military equipment transferred by them to Israel might be used to facilitate or commi commit serious violations of international law. That threshold has clearly been met. In the United Kingdom today, Human Rights Watch is working together with a coalition of organisations to push the UK government to impose an arms embargo now. We are looking at intervening in a case that has been brought by our colleagues at Al Haq. And we have been also pushing relentlessly for the government to impose sanctions on Israel beyond an arms embargo and beyond the four settlers that have been sanctioned for the activities in the West Bank. We are pushing for the UK government to ensure that they support accountability efforts at the ICC and the Human Rights Council to make sure that they are investigating UK officials and UK nationals who may be complicit in crimes and to be using every point of leverage, whether that's trade, diplomatic, military and other forms, to ensure that Israel ends the atrocities against the Palestinian people. Thank you. I thank you, Madam, for your presentation. Uh, which highlights the important work uh, made by civil society in the, in the UK in terms of advocacy and outreach to the government and of raising awareness of the impact of Israel's war on, on, on Gaza. Another valued uh, human rights expert joining us today from Australia is Mrs. Rowan Araf, the executive director of the Australian Centre for International Justice. She has a decade of legal experience in refugee protection and international human rights law. Mrs. Arraf is actively engaged with lawyers and organizations working in universal jurisdiction litigation abroad. She will be presenting on her organization efforts to outreach to the Australian government and lawmakers and raise awareness of the ongoing war in that country. Thank you, Madame, for traveling from far for this event. It is a pleasure and honor to have you with us uh, here. And please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair, and to the committee and excellencies for the opportunity to present at this important conference and to be on this esteemed panel. I'm honored to be providing the committee and all present today a brief insight into Australian grassroots and civil society response to the most ferocious military assault on Gaza and the Palestinian people since the 1948 Nakba. The response has been multifaceted and widespread, given the majority support from the Australian people for a permanent ceasefire. Visibly, it has been evident in the weekly weekend protest marches across the country since the assault began in what is now the largest anti-war movement in Australia since the war against Iraq. Very early on, civil society rallied to put out a statement calling for a permanent ceasefire, supported by over 100 organisations, especially as Parliament remained silent on the atrocities unfolding in Gaza and focused only on the unlawful attacks and violence committed on 7 October by Palestinian armed groups in Israel. 
While it was evident that Israel's attacks from the outset were manifestly in violation of international law and at minimum ought to have been condemned, the Australian government and the majority of the Australian parliament ignored Israel's attacks, even in the face of what was prima facie evidence and statements of genocidal intent and policies coming from Israeli authorities. The civil society response has at many times been difficult and marred by anti-Palestinian racism, where concerted actions by the right-wing press, some politicians and pro-Israel lobby groups derailed focus from Israel's genocidal attacks on Gaza and resorted to attacking Palestinians and their supporters who advocate for Palestinian human rights. Palestinian-led civil society groups have welcomed, advocated for and mobilised to help support and settle those arriving from Gaza, about 350 so far. Activists, academics, unions, writers, artists have all responded with statements, protests, sit-ins, workshops and in some cases direct actions at Australian ports of entry targeting Israeli shipping lines who play some role in Israel's crimes in Gaza. Mums, teachers, lawyers, healthcare workers for Palestine are just some of the many groups that have sprung up in the last several months where people are organising in their local communities and professions. I was recently invited to the small city of Newcastle on the country of the Awaba peoples who are the traditional owners of that land and who never ceded sovereignty. The local community are hosting Conversations for Palestine, a series of public forums to educate communities and organise in strategic ways to end Australian complicity with Israeli crimes in all its forms. They are horrified, for example, that in their community, the Australian arms manufacturer Vali Group is doing business with an Israeli arms company in several contracts selling Israeli military technology to the Australian military. I was on a panel with a local Aboriginal elder who helped set up Palestinian Action Group in Palestine in uh, Newcastle years ago, Auntie Tracy Henshaw. It has been heartening to see the Black Palestinian Solidarity Movement among Palestinian communities and First Nations people on the Australian continent continue to grow as a testament to shared global struggles against settler colonialism. The statements from the Victorian and New South Wales Aboriginal Legal Services calling for a ceasefire and an end to Israel's colonial violence, uh, occupation and apartheid are just some examples of that solidarity in action. While it's true that Australia supports a ceasefire, it took almost three months for Australia to support that call by voting in favour of the December General Assembly resolution. It has hardly condemned Israel's actions. Australia sees itself as a middle power, committed to international law. Yet successive Australian governments, whether conservative or progressive, have allied with Israel and provided it with political cover um, and engaged enthusiastically in developing significant economic and military ties, despite Israel's countless violations of international law. This impunity from UN member states like Australia must end. Australia's foreign minister has in the last several months sought to paint Australia's role as limited in its ability to influence. In light of Australia's significant military, political and trade links, this is a subversion of reality when Australia should be doing more by imposing the countermeasures it has available to it when states are in the commission of internationally wrongful acts. Given the reveal that Australia had approved 322 arms export permits to Israel since 2017, without any information about what was exported, our legal centre, representing three Palestinian human rights organisations, Al Haq Palestinian Centre for Human Rights and Al Mizan Centre for Human Rights, filed in the federal court against the Minister for Defence in an attempt to gain more transparency over the process. We had to discontinue that application for reasons that I cannot discuss, but are still related to the problem of transparency. However, we are determined to continue to find avenues to uncover information and challenge those export decisions as we are concerned about exports via third countries. We therefore remain concerned the Minister for Defence is failing to act on Australia's legal obligations. We do think that that proceeding we filed, though brief, did have an impact on the Australian government and any concerns it may have had about its complicity because, according to media reports, the government has been stalling arms export permits to Israel. 
The Australian government initially ignored the ICJ order and instead immediately suspended funding to UNRWA. Australia only, only reversed that disgraceful decision two weeks ago. Prior to the ICJ's order, the Foreign Minister stated that Australia does not accept the premise of the South African application. The finding of a plausible case of genocide by the ICJ forced Australia to change its response to the South African application. It finally acknowledged the ICJ order almost a week later, and there was a more substantial statement calling on Israel to comply with the court's decision in mid-February. In its initial statement, Australia stated that the ICJ's decision is binding on the parties. That, however, does not discharge Australia of its own legal obligations. The prohibition of genocide is a use cohesions norm, and all states have a duty to bring to an end any violation of those norms through lawful means. Our legal centre and Australian civil society have called on Australia to hold an inquiry and review and assess its political, military and economic relationships with Israel and move to impose diplomatic sanctions and travel bans against Israeli officials. At minimum, Australia should impose an arms embargo, a call now supported by several UN special rapporteurs. A comprehensive response must consider a two-way arms embargo, and Australia should rescind existing contracts with Israeli arms manufacturers. Furthermore, Australia should, advise, uh, should issue an advisory to dual nationals, warning them of criminal liability when serving or volunteering abroad in the Israeli military. Australia should monitor those individuals who are abroad, investigate them on return, and refer them to prosecution where appropriate. Thank you very much. I thank Mrs. Arraf for her informative uh, presentation. And now we have our fourth speaker, Mrs. Uh, Tilda Rabi. We, uh, she will be intervening as the president of the Federation of Argentine Palestinian Entities. She's one of the most recognized activists for the Palestinian cause in Argentina as the host of a radio program the voice of the Palestinian diaspora in Argentina, and a member of the Argentine Committee of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. She will also be presenting on the solidarity movement in her country and the Latin American region. Thank you for joining us today, Madame. You have an important challenge in, in your country, and you have the floor. Just, just one second, Mr. Chair. Can you please just make sure that your colleague is okay? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Gracias. Gracias eh, al comité. Gracias a las presencias. Gracias a todos, a todas y a todes eh, por estar hoy convocándonos para hablar una vez más de la urgencia y la necesidad eh, que significan las acciones por y para Palestina y para terminar con este genocidio sistemático. Eh, quiero mandar también el saludo de, una nueva, de un nuevo colectivo que se ha formado en la Argentina y que pertenece al feminismo global por Palestina, el Grupo Sandías. Eh, hay un abrazo para todas y todos para seguir desde los diferentes ángulos eh, participando. Bueno, hablando de la ocupación y la colonización de los territorios palestinos por parte de la potencia ocupante Israel, es que se ha derivado en múltiples agresiones contra la población indígena preexistente generando la expulsión de sus tierras ancestrales, así como la detención arbitraria y el asesinato sistemático de las mismas. De allí que una herramienta utilizada como política de Estado por parte de Israel es que son sus innumerables crímenes cometidos por el ente sionista aún antes de la partición de nuestra Palestina histórica, hace ya más de 75 años. La Nakba continúa. Hoy, y desde inicios del pasado octubre, estas prácticas opresivas configuran una de las problemáticas más graves que no afectan no solo a Palestina, sino al mundo en su totalidad, porque ponen a prueba nuestra propia humanidad, pues indefectiblemente se, se traducen en sufrimiento, destrucción y pérdida de vidas humanas, 
ante esta realidad, la sociedad civil y los actores sociales que la componen juegan un papel fundamental y determinante a través de una participación activa y coordinada entre quienes trabajamos, defendemos y divulgamos la causa palestina en diferentes ámbitos y procesos del sur global. Se trata, evidentemente, de romper con la narrativa deshumanizadora que nos entregan los medios de comunicación hegemónicos, que es también una parte sustancial de nuestro trabajo y, por tanto, una de las bases de nuestra tarea como sociedad civil consciente. Los instrumentos con los que contamos los colectivos sociales y espacios de militancia en defensa de Palestina básicamente son la concientización y la movilidad de la sociedad civil que, desea, que desempeña un papel protagónico y crucial en esos dos aspectos. Dicha tarea la llevamos a cabo por medio de actividades en las calles como manifestaciones, mitines y concentraciones, exigiendo el fuego, el fuego inmediato, el respeto irrestricto de los derechos humanos de las y los palestinos, la responsabilidad de nuestro gobierno como partícipes necesarios de las masacres cometidas, ya que muchos de ellos validan o consienten las mismas con sus silencios, o a veces a través de convenios gubernamentales que se establecen con el Estado de Israel, que no solo afectan e impactan en la vida de todo un pueblo, sino también lo hace, lo hace de forma directa en los territorios latinoamericanos. Especialmente en Argentina, desde hace unos años, hemos sufrido un gran retroceso. Si bien en el año 2014 tu, ganamos una batalla fre, para frenar un acuerdo con la empresa de aguas israelí Mecorot en la provincia de Buenos Aires, gracias a la sociedad civil y sus organizaciones, forzando a la legislatura bonaerense a hacer un pedido de informes que... Con, que concluyó la paralización de tal acuerdo, era una batalla ganada, al igual que ciertas acciones al pedido de boicot cultural deportivo que como integrantes del movimiento, del movimiento BDS regional ejecutamos. A inicios del año 2022, parte hacia Israel una nutrida delegación encabezada por el mismísimo ministro del Interior y 11 gobernadores provinciales a cerrar un acuerdo y convenios de colaboración científica, cultural y entre otras áreas, también con la empresa Mecorot. Y es aquí donde vale destacar el rol de la sociedad civil del Comité Argentino de Solidaridad con el Pueblo Palestino, que ha ido creando puentes y tejiendo acciones para concientizar también a las asambleas en las diferentes provincias que han firmado acuerdos con Mecorot y visibilizar las nuevas formas de colonización también en el territorio argentino. De más está decir que el actual gobierno argentino es un aliado incondicional del sionismo y por esa razón y frente a las políticas represivas y salvajes en nuestro territorio, muchos sectores han comprendido cabalmente lo que son las políticas coloniales sionistas que aquí en el territorio argentino quieren aplicar habiendo adherido ya a la Alianza Internacional para el Recuerdo del Holocausto, IRA, donde se ha profundizado la persecu persecución y criminalización de aquellos que se atreven a denunciar al ente sionista en Argentina. Por supuesto, los actores sociales que nos acompañan en esta travesía son diversos y muy necesarios, entre ellos sindicatos, juntas vecinales, comunitarias, partidos y agrupaciones políticas, organizaciones no gubernamentales, inclusive sectores religiosos, grupos comunitarios que suelen ser los facilitadores y promotores de mecanismos que favorezcan la resolución de un tema tan caro a la humanidad como lo es la inmensa tragedia sin precedentes actuales del pueblo palestino y en particular el asesinato de más de 35.000 civiles, de los cuales el 70% son niños, niñas y mujeres. Por desgracia, si no presionamos desde la sociedad civil, 
no únicamente desde el sur global, sino también desde los países que conforman el occidente central, esta cifra aumentará exponencialmente. Otra función considerablemente de, favor, de valor que posee la sociedad civil es la de ser un agente activo, colectivo de monitoreo y supervisación de los procesos de resolución, de resolución y descolonización por intermedio de la creación de comités, delegaciones o juntas se transforman de alguna manera en observadores, vigilantes, verificando el cumplimiento de los acuerdos y tratados internacionales, así como la denuncia a las violaciones de derechos humanos, que es urgente accionar y pensar en clave con la empatía y humanidad, con gestiones como las que ha promovido el gobierno de Sudáfrica, señalando los crímenes de apartheid y odio, confrontando a una comunidad internacional sesgada por intereses espurios que no han permitido siquiera un alto al fuego. Se requiere un posicionamiento claro en el derecho internacional y en el enfrentamiento de quienes hoy están perpetrando el genocidio más documentado de la historia humana. Debemos alejarnos del silencio cómplice y contribuir a for al fortalecimiento y la confianza en el protagonismo y el papel fundamental que tenemos como sociedad en los procesos de pacificación y descolonización tan, tan postergados ya en pleno siglo XXI. Fanon, Fran Fanon decía, una lucha que moviliza Todas las capas del pueblo que expresa las intenciones y las impaciencias del pueblo, que no teme apoyarse casi exclusivamente en este pueblo, es necesariamente victoriosa. Thank you very much, Ms. Ravi, for, for sharing your expertise and experience in, in leading the Palestinian Solidarity Movement in Argentina uh, with uh, the audience. Last but no least, Mr. Frank uh, Chican will be intervening on the support of the civil society to the Palestinian cause in South Africa. Mr. Chican has decades of experience and expertise on the Palestinian question under many hats and capacities, including with the South African government. But he will be speaking today in his capacity as the chair of the steering committee of the Global Anti-Apartheid Conference, planned and made in South Africa. Mr. Chicane served in many key roles in his country, for example, as the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches and the Director General in the Presidency of the Government of South Africa. It is a privilege uh, to have you here, sir. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. The, I must say that uh, I've, I've delivered the paper, so I won't read it. I'll speak to it. And then I must say that listening since this morning to the presentations, discussions, it's very painful for me to go through this again because it's like a repeat of the same show, same film. We were here in the 80s fighting an apartheid system. We used to come and appear before the UN. And uh, the same countries that are involved are still the same countries today. Um, the United States, Britain, France, and Western countries supported the apartheid system fully. They also gave them capacity of nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, some of which were used against us. And, and my presentation is about how we would put pressure on these governments to stop supporting apartheid Israel, settler colonialism in, in Israel, in the same way we did with South Africa. We didn't start with people supporting South Africa. We ended with them doing so. It's not out of conversion 
or changing their minds. It's by force. So we're not going to have them changing their minds. We're going to have to actually put pressure on them. So I want to say in a point form, for one who, has, who was and has lived through a neo-colonial racist apartheid society, when I visited Palestine, Israel, and I will call it like that for purposes of this presentation, for the first time in 1988, um, I was actually um, asked by a Jewish rabbi to go there and see both sides. And I have spent two days with the Israelis, two days with the Palestinians. And I came out there convinced that what I saw there in 1988 was worse than what we're experiencing in South Africa at the height of the apartheid system in South Africa. And, and I could not miss the fact that this is a settler colonial apartheid system and I do elaborate in the paper. In terms of the later evidence, Jewish national state law, I read it. You can't miss clear apartheid. It's not discrimination and except. You don't need a, a, an education about that. And then uh, during the latter visit in 2022, we went to Sheikh Jarrah, met Palestinians who were driven out of um, um, various parts of Israel during 1948. They still had keys for their houses and want to go back home. But an, a Jewish person can live from any part of the world, arrive there and claim the land where they are, and the law permitted that. But the Palestinian was removed in 1948, can't do the same. And that can prove apartheid racism more than uh, that would be. So I just want to say that uh, to make the points, um, I'm still shocked that the world has allowed such a racist apartheid system to continue after declaring apartheid a crime against humanity. The UN made that declaration. Uh, secondly, it is still shocking that the world could allow Palestinians to be illegally occupied for about 57 years. I like uh, the way Sorani put it, uh, the second version, the older, the, the longer version is 75 years, and that you could blockade Gaza for 16 years and expect them to do nothing. And I just want to say, if we try to blockade the United States today, you will see hell. <laughs> they will not allow it. And there will be no talk of terrorism. It will be we defending ourselves. And, and I think the world has bought into this logic that doesn't make sense, that you blockade people and you don't expect them to do anything about it. I want to say, I uh, met some of the detainees who came out of detention lately. One, as one who has been detained for a long time, tortured, etc. I can imagine how all those people who were captured in Gaza were treated. And there is no world to monitor what is happening there. And, and, and that is unbelievable that the world can allow that. And I just want to say, um, as, as what I would like to propose as a solution is that unless we drill down to the real problem, we will not be able to solve this problem. We'll make speeches, we'll talk, nothing will happen. We'll have a conference like this and nothing happens afterwards. I am convinced the problem starts from the beginning. It's the Balfour Declaration, 1970, it's the Nakba in 19, uh, 1948. It's the resolution of the UN that partitioned Palestine. And once you partitioned it, and you only established one of the states, the others don't have a state, and you empowered that state, empowered them, armed them to the teeth, but there's no Palestinian state. Even if you disagreed with the partitioning, 
But at least they should have had a Palestinian state in the same way they had the Israeli state. They did not do that. The also agreements came, they were adopted, but nothing happened as well. So resolutions of the UN don't work. And so what we have done, and I want to sum it up in this way, is that we have allowed the Israel to be emboldened to pursue the Zionist project. And the Zionist project is expressed clearly, much more clearly, by Bezalel Smotrich, the current finance minister in the cabinet of Israel, who says in his paper, either Israel, Palestinians submit or they leave or they die. There are three options for Palestinians. You leave, and that's why they're pushing them to the boil, to leave Gaza so they can take over, to brutalize them in West Bank so they can take over. That's fulfilling the Nakba <coughs> as it was envisaged. And, and because of that, uh, the world has allowed them, because of failure of the world, it has allowed them to do this right in front of the world, publicly seen, killing kids. And, and if any of what is happening in Gaza would happen in any of the Western countries today, there will be hell. They will not allow 30,000 people to be killed uh, in the manner in which the Palestinians are killed. And, I, and my conclusion is that this can only be people who think in settler-colonial, racist, apartheid way, because Palestinians are not human beings. You have to have that view. It's like dealing with slaves during slavery, during the colonization. There were many genocides the colonialists committed in this world. They are not even recorded because they didn't treat people as human beings. And I just want to conclude, um, uh, Chair, by saying three things. That firstly, you had to have a racist settler colonial mind to establish a settler colonial system at the time when colonialization was coming to an end. 1948, it was the time when it was coming to an end. But they established one at that point. Secondly, brutalizing Palestinians in the way it's being done, it's simply say racist. We shouldn't even beat about the bush. You, you have to think they are not human beings to do what is being done. And I just want to say the reverse part of it is that the Israelis are being brutalized themselves and traumatized. There's no soldier who will kill so many children and be normal after. And so you'll see the Israeli society is going to be reinvented to be something else that doesn't think it is anything wrong in killing so many children. Um, and I just want to say our plan um, uh, and I don't want to say it's South African, we're asked by the Palestinians to host that conference. And our plan is to invite, we have done so already, we are inviting civil society worldwide, all the continents of the world, to meet in South Africa in May 10 to 12. That date is fixed. And we want to come together to strategize on how we do what the anti-apartheid movement did for South Africa, a global movement, um, and force the states to do what they are supposed to do. And I'm convinced that we did it with South Africa. The United States would not su support us and until we put them under pressure through their citizens to be able to adopt the, the sanctions resolution against apartheid South Africa, the same with the other governments. And I'm convinced that waiting for the states to change 
will not achieve anything. It is us who should do it. Lastly, I would like to say that history has shown that no empire lasts forever. Read history. And that those who have power must know that power does come to an end. That if one has power, one must use it circumspectly for the good of humanity, rather than for self-interest, because it will turn against them in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, the, the paper of uh, Professor Shikan is being uploaded on the website of the committee. You can uh, check it later. Um, now we are going to take a break. Before that, I'm going to do what uh, a share shouldn't do. That is, uh, I'm going to present the first question uh, for um, um, when we resume uh, the session, because we have heard a lot about the, the apartheid here uh, from Professor Shikan. And there is a movement within UN, there is a movement also uh, of NGOs talking about the possibility of using the fruitful uh, South African anti-apartheid experience in United Nations uh, and using also the special committee against apartheid uh, uh, within United Nations. And that will be the first question when resuming for, for Professor and, and for the NGOs here. How uh, could we use the, the Special Committee Against Apartheid or at least the experiences of South Africa to advance the Palestinian cause today that is uh, much needed? So with this question, uh, we are going to uh, make a break. Uh, so you have some coffee and, and short break. We will be starting resuming at 4.15. Can do 4, 10, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready to start our discussions. Participants are welcome to ask questions or make comments on the presentations that uh, you have heard this afternoon. Please introduce yourself at the beginning and try as much as possible to be brief. So, um, we have uh, raised a first question, but we are going to have a round, on, uh, a round of questions and comments. And later, we are, we are going to give the floor to uh, the panelists. So I'm saying, uh, please, uh, Hishasi, you have the floor. You can't hear now, can you? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll repeat. My name is Saleh Hijazi. I'm from the Palestinian uh, BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions National Committee. It's the leadership of the global nonviolent BDS movement. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank South Africa, South Africans, for the principled uh, moral and ethical voice that we've been hearing today from Reverend Frank Chikani, and of course from South Africa at, at The Hague. Um, uh, you lead us all, uh, and we hope all states will follow suit. Uh, my first question, and I, I would like also to remind of the chair's question on the Special Committee Against Apartheid, which is uh, a demand by all Palestinian civil society, <coughs> uh, as well as the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Uh, but to Mr. Say, uh, you spoke about the U.S. failing its obligations, uh, about aiding and abetting genocide, and, and if you could, you know, given that we have a number uh, of states here represented, uh, many, if not all, are party to the Genocide Convention, uh, what are these obligations and what are the legal consequences of failing these, living up to your uh, obligations? Um, and to uh, Ms. Ahmed, uh, you spoke about complicity, uh, our movement targets uh, complicity. Uh, Palestinians have been calling for an arms embargo uh, for many decades now. Uh, so we're very happy that Human Rights Watch and others are now calling for this. Uh, if you could comment on uh, the details of the military embargo, we call for a three-way military embargo. No buying, no selling, no transfer. And particularly on the transfer 
of weapons, those transit countries would appreciate your comments on that. And also, you mentioned sanctions beyond arms embargo. We've heard from special rapporteurs, most recently a special rapporteur Francesca Albanese in her recent report on settler colonial genocide, which was presented to, this, uh, to the Human Rights Council uh, about financial, economic, diplomatic, and other sanctions. So if, if we can hear more details uh, about those sanctions. And finally, to, to all the panel, uh, if you would agree that, like in the case of apartheid South Africa, apartheid Israel, now committing genocide, has no place in the United Nations and should be expelled from the UN General Assembly. Would, would also appreciate your comments on this. Thank you. Thank you for, for this, uh, these questions. We have some questions there. Um, any other um, representative or delegation would like to make some statement, comment, or question? Uh, I'm seeing uh, there, GD, GD is my site as well. Uh, you have the floor, please. Uh, good, af good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I am very honored to be taking part of this conference in representation of the Colombian Solidarity Movement for Palestine and of the Palestinian community in Colombia. I just wanted to share some lessons or insights that we have learned uh, since October due to the very complicated um, situation in many Latin American countries where we usually have, instead of state policies, we have government policies. So every with every change of government, um, things can change or stay the same. So for the past 20 years, really, until the current president, Gustavo Petro, took office, we had a very uh, solid relationship with Israel, basically um, steering from Israel's very active involvement during the Cold War years in supplying, for example, weapons, militaristic training, um, funding even um, authoritarian dictatorships in the region and a counter-revolutionary movement. So um, there are many ties, most of them invisible, that um, tie Israel to Latin America and that inform the policies of many of the governments. With President Petro, things are completely different for us. We have moved from being a community that was suffering anti-Palestinianism, even before anti-Palestinianism became an issue after October 7 around the world. We were facing that before, since the beginning of this century. Um, so we were struggling to be organized, to have solid institutions, to have a solid movement. But since October 7 and our president's very explicit um, postures on Palestine, the civil society in Colombia has made an impressive shift. We are very surprised by the um, popularity that now our cause, what many people say is the most universal national cause, has taken root in the Colombian civil society. But we're also very appalled by the silence of still many stakeholders and actors in Colombia and other Latin American countries. So in this process, where the Palestinian community and the civil society organizations have found a way to coordinate and work together, bargaining and negotiating motivations, interests, which is of course a challenge. We have also identified some other challenges that I briefly would like to mention with, the, with, the, with everyone here, because I think that can assist others facing similar situations like the one we have in Colombia. Um, we have seen that no legal mechanism can work without political will, and this isn't in an international and, of course, national levels. Um, our president and many of us may want something, uh, but and we might have the legal instruments, but sometimes the leverage, we don't have enough leverage, so that's something we have to work on. Um, second, we have to reach out 
to other constituencies rather than the traditional constituencies that usually hear us. We cannot continue to speak to the same people because we feel comfortable and it is easy. And by this I mean in the political spectrum we all know what side tends to be more um, friendly towards Palestine. But we need to, to stop um, perpetuating this way of working in which we we, we speak to traditional partners always, and we don't dare to take the step and find the creative ways to get to other partners that usually do not listen to us. Um, there's also been a, a, a raising issue in, with intersectionality. Intersectionality has posed both a challenge, although it's a tool, and although it's a very strong mechanism for us because our cause, well, Palestinian cause, is really universal, but it's also a challenge when there are so many um, interests trying to find a, a, a voice in the movement. So these are, is, these are basically some of the, um, the challenges we, we have identified for us in Colombia that maybe are, resonate to others. And, and last, it's, um, I think we should establish also priorities because the ways we have been working for the past 75 years or since the start of the military occupation or since the start of the genocide in Gaza have proven to be responding to what's happening but not a long-term strategy that can really bring change. And at the root of what's going on today, it's not only the lack of accountability and the presence of decades of impunity, but we feel that also at the root is the settler colonial process that necessarily needs um, a land free of Palestinians, um, this pervasive, quote unquote, minority, unwanted and dangerous minority. So we should also be addressing this, um, this ongoing process and the genocide as a manifestation of it. Besides also, of course, using the framework for anti-apartheid. We should also focus on how to implement a real decolonial strategy that can assure peace with, with, with accountability. Thank you very much. Sí, gracias. Le agradezco a eh, la participante y también agradecemos el liderazgo del presidente Petro en la causa palestina en los, en, los últimos, en los últimos tiempos. Ojalá y se convierta en una política de Estado en Colombia. Uh, I now give the floor to uh, one NGO first. Uh, so you have the floor. Later we have the other one. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dominic Renfrey with the Center for Constitutional Rights. It would be interesting, um, as my colleague mentioned earlier, about the value, potential value and efficacy of sanctions. Um, I ask particularly to the panel about um, what possible effects could come from targeted sanctions related to corporations. Yes, we see and identify clearly arms corporations, but of course um, the entire settler colonial enterprise is uh, propped up by um, profit and financing of all sectors. It would be interesting to hear from the experience of the panelists um, on how this has been uh, effective in the past and may uh, also be effective in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the other NGO there, you, you, you have the floor. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Romel Shamsuddin. I'm from B Padana Global Peace Foundation in Malaysia. Um, uh, Padana Global Peace Foundation has uh, been quite, I would say, notorious <laughs> in um, uh, charging George Bush and Tony Blair for war, cri war crimes uh, about 10 years ago. Um, uh, and there was a KL called Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal. Um, why I'm saying this is um, we have to look towards charging uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's government, him and his government and his generals, in ensuring that they are accountable to the war crimes that they are committing 
in front of the world right now and for the last few decades. Uh, we can see the recent world central kitchen killings, which is so obvious and is so uh, dis uh, um, disturbing uh, and still be accepted by the world governments. You know? And um, this cannot happen. Gaza is facing a famine now. We are looking at a half a million to one million death scenario within the next few weeks. Uh, so that, this is the big elephant in the room that we have not really, really look at. And I believe that this has to be in the resolution tomorrow and urgently pursued by the United Nations and the world governments. Uh, the, the, uh, our foundation has just issued a statement asking for responsibility to protect and peacekeepers in Gaza to ensure that humanitarian aid and food is supplied safely to the people who need it before they die of starvation. Um, I'm sorry to be so forceful, but this is the tragedy that we are seeing in front of our eyes. Well, I'm sure all you gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen have done decades of great work. But unfortunately, this is going to happen within the next few weeks. So I, I hope we come up with a good resolution tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. I have a lady. Uh, please, you have the floor. Judy Arafa, from the Association of Geneva Democratic Republic. The question is: What is the role of the Arab countries in the support of migrants, the Palestinians, or the demands for return from the legal perspective? Thank you for your attention. Please, lady, you have the floor. Said, I am from Iran, representing Iranian Elite Research Center. Uh, also uh, managing an orphanage back in Iran. Uh, so what is happening these days in uh, Palestine is very shameful, especially number of uh, children are killing. Uh, there, it's uh, unbelievable, and and also um, I wanted to talk about the air struck um, two days ago uh, on Iranian uh, consulate in Syria, which was uh, uh, an obvious violation of the United Nations Charter and uh, also international laws. And I want to see if uh, you. Uh, people holding this conference here are going to do anything about this because if it is going to be continued is very it's very um, it's going to be very dangerous and um, it's going um, to start uh, something new in their region and um, uh, nobody can stop it after that if we don't do anything about this thank you very much Okay, I'm going to give the floor to uh, Dee Camis. You have the floor, please. Buenas tardes. Desde la Comunidad Palestina de Chile, eh, creo que en un panel donde se habla de la responsabilidad de la sociedad civil en un tema como el tema palestino, es muy importante preguntarle a los expertos eh, cuál creen que debe ser el rol que tienen que jugar las comunidades palestinas en la diáspora en los respectivos países y dentro del rol de la, de la sociedad civil, porque si bien nosotros somos miembros y partes activas de nuestras sociedades civiles, el rol que nos cabe, a mi juicio, por eso me interesa su opinión, es distinto del rol que le puede caber por el involucramiento a personas que no tienen este origen. Eh, por lo tanto, me gustaría saber cuál es la opinión de eso, el rol de las comunidades palestinas dentro de la sociedad civil de nuestros países. Okay, uh, with this, at least in my, in my notes, I have at least 10 questions. So uh, I imagine that uh, each panelist has something to say. I identified in the voices of the panelists that we have a lot of uh, lawyers, 
That's why uh, they should have something to say. You know, when you have two lawyers, you have a controversy. And when you have more than two, you could have an international uh, conflict. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to, to um, I propose to start in the same order that we present, uh, we made our presentation. And I will give the floor to Mrs. Say for you to uh, answer those questions or parts of the questions that you consider useful. And let's see if when uh, we finish all uh, the panelists, all the questions are already uh, answered. If not, I will remember and we will try. Okay, so Mrs. Say, you have the floor, please. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for everyone for your questions. I will um, answer two questions. The specific question um, that was uh, targeted towards me around uh, obligations, legal obligations under the Genocide Convention of third-party states, uh, and then also the question of the role of Palestinian um, diaspora um, in the in the fight that's going on. Uh, so, so yes. So, <laughs> under the the Genocide Convention, there is a legal obligation to prevent genocide. So, I think what we see happening in a lot of countries, or even at the UN, is this discussion as to whether or not we should even be, be using the term genocide. Is it a genocide? Is that actually what is happening? And I think that question is disingenuous and it's just a stalling tactic uh, because the convention doesn't say a genocide has to be underway for it to apply. It says if there's enough evidence to show that this could pa plausibly become a genocide, there's a duty to prevent. And that duty extends to all parties, right? It does not only extend to Israel. Um, and so it's not about whether or not we want to have legal arguments about whether genocide applies right now. It's the fact that we know that there is mass killing happening. There is targeted starvation um, and basically Israel creating a situation where people, a mass number of people are going to die. Um, and we know this is occurring. And so this obligation exists. So under the convention, like, I said, uh, there's the obligation, obviously, to not commit genocide. There's the obligation to punish genocide. And then there's also an obligation to prosecute, right, um, genocide or folks who are engaged in genocide. And so because genocide, like I said before, is the gravest of all crimes under international law, um, it's something that applies to everyone. And so all state parties, all countries should be doing everything possible uh, to be ending the situation that we know is a unfolding, or if you speak to others, is a genocide um, in Gaza. But that is not what is happening specifically in the United States, where the US is accountable for over 70% of all munition and arms that is going to Israel, that is being used in Gaza. We know almost if not all the warplanes that Israel is using comes from the United States. And we know that the United States government is currently in communication with Congress trying to do more arms sales, to provide more financial support um, to Israel. And they continue to, on the UN level until recently, uh, basically do everything in, in their power to intervene and veto any type of resolution calling for a ceasefire, right? And so in our understanding and why this case, we brought this case, is that the U.S. is at this point doing more than just not stopping a genocide. They are actively aiding and abetting. Um, and so that is why we really focused on the Genocide Convention when we brought this litigation. You know, rather than like war crimes, crimes against humanity, we really wanted to, because this was a call coming from Palestinian civil society, to say that this isn't a war. This isn't a humanitarian crisis. This is a genocide that's specifically targeting Palestinians and is made to eradicate Palestinians, right? And to ensure that that is the term that we were using and that we were being truthful um, to people in Gaza, but also just generally Palestinian civil society. Um, and I think this is get, gets at the question of what is the role of Palestinian society in the diaspora. And I think in the United States specifically, um, we have seen a lot of leadership um, from Palestinians in the diaspora, right? When we brought the litigation, we wanted to make sure that it was on behalf of Palestinians. So everyone who is a plaintiff um, in the U.S. litigation against Bi Biden, Blinken, and Austin are Palestinian. Even Palestinian Americans, Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinians living in other places, right? Because we wanted to center the voices of Palestinians because what we see oftentimes happens in the United States, um, and I think 
it's a tactic that people are using as you see the voices of Jewish Americans really uplifted to speak against the genocide and to say, not in my name, you know, like we, you can't say that you're doing this for us. And I think that is incredibly powerful and it works in the United States, but it decenters Palestinians, right? And so we really wanted to ensure that the work that we were doing centered Palestinians and that their voices and their testimony um, and their accusations against the United States government and what it is doing was loud and clear. Um, we've also seen a huge mobilization in the United States by Palestinian Americans, other Arab Americans, and just everyone, honestly, who has a conscience and has a heart that is like with Gaza and, and is focused on this issue um, around the elections. You know, in the United States, we are in an election year. Meaning, meaning that President Biden um, is going up for election in November. And so there have been huge efforts uh, to really show the Democratic Party and President Bl um, Biden in the United States that this issue of the United States support of Israeli action in Gaza could lose him the election. Um, and there's been a lot of work done by individuals to really disrupt um, election spaces to not vote for Biden um, during the primaries. And there has been mass protest um, that has been happening. And what we have seen that do is shift Congress in the United States. Um, in October, we had maybe two congressional members who were calling for a ceasefire, which I believe is the minimum, right? There should be more than just a call for a ceasefire. But in the United States, we had maybe two people in our legislature who were making that call and essentially going against the president. At this point, we have garnered the support of a, a large number of people in the US legislature and in Congress who are now calling for a ceasefire, calling for an end of weapons sales and really scrutinizing the US support for Israel. And that's because of Palestinian civil society, as well as other people who are doing immense work in the United States to ensure that this issue um, is not forgotten and that the United States doesn't, um, is held accountable for, for its role. Yeah, uh, civil society is uh, very important all over the world. But uh, when we are talking about uh, this issue this year in, within the United States, it is particularly important. As you know, or as you should know, um, yesterday uh, there was presented um, from the state of Palestine um, a request to the Security Council to have a discussion in April on their membership. They are asking again for being a member of the UN. So there is going to be uh, a decision in the Security Council in, in April, if approved. So uh, we have to discuss further in the UNGA, but UNGA is not going to be, uh, we know the problem. So civil society during this particular year of elections in in United States are going to be key if we want to uh, obtain uh, and give the membership that uh, Palestine deserve uh, in the in the UN community. So now I give the floor to uh, Mrs. Ahmed. Uh, there are questions about military embargo, sanctions, or something like that. But please be free to to answer whatever you you consider useful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone who uh, asked a question and also um, raised really important points. I think before I answer the specific questions uh, or some of the specific questions that have been asked, I want to make a comment from where I sit um, at Human Rights Watch but also in the United Kingdom doing advocacy on this issue to say that when we are in a situation like we are now where it feels like and I think it, it feels like it cannot get worse, and unfortunately it may get worse, it is also an opportunity for change. So with the heaviness that I know everyone in this room has experienced over the last six months, myself including, I find every day difficult, to be honest, because of what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, um, and what we're bearing witness to. I also think this is a moment that the international community needs to take and to say enough is enough and to use the appetite for change. And there is some appetite for change here. I, I want to say that 
for example, where, where I see some of that appetite for change happening um, from the UK perspective and for my engagement with the UK government, and I know my, my um, colleagues uh, at Human Rights Watch who are also working in other capital C, is that many states are saying that the way forward has to be a two-state solution. And what we see now happening in the West Bank in particular, but also happening in Gaza, is anything but the possibility of a two-state solution. We are seeing not just the continuation of settlements, but the expansion of settlements. And I think what we need to be saying very, very clearly to our governments and holding them to what the next day, what this might look like, is how in the world can we see moving forward when you are taking no action to make, in fact, make that possible or to ensure that there is a possibility. So what we did see, we saw some sanctions against individual settlers, uh, both by the US and by the UK, but we need more to ensure that those that are participating in and are otherwise facilitating and involved at the state and the individual and the organisational level are sanctioned. And that there is a clear message that that will not be tolerated and that there will be consequences for that. I think speaking to the question of broader sanctions, so what we have said is that obviously there's an obligation on states to not be complicit in action, so that they should be not just not providing weapons because of their uh, uh, domestic obligations, but also because of their international obligations with respect to facilitating international crimes. But beyond that, states also have obligations, ergo omnes, and broader obligations under the Geneva Convention, Article 1, to prevent and also under the Genocide Convention to prevent atrocities from being committed. And in relation to that broader obligation, they need to be thinking about broader sanctions beyond arms embargoes. Sanctions that will be imposed on Israel as a result of their activity to prevent what they are doing. So in relation to that, what does that in practice look like? It looks like broader military cooperation, security, security cooperation, tra re-evaluating trade agreements and trade privileges, diplomatic cooperation. It should be an in the entire gambit of cooperation with the State of Israel needs to be re-evaluated and states need to be using their leverage. The ICJ has been very clear in a number of its cases and it said states with particularly close relationships with a state that is committing violations have further obligations on them to stop those crimes from be and, and those violations from being committed. So in terms of uh, the question around arms sales and whether it should be a three-way uh, suspension and prohibition? Yes, the, que the answer is yes. It should be at this time, because states have an obligation not only to be not complicit, but an ob obligation to prevent, it should be a suspension on buying, selling and transferring of weapons to Israel, and that should happen immediately. The fact that we're sitting here today, the day after three British nationals and a UK national, an Australian national and a Polish national and a Palestinian national were killed, and after obviously thousands of Palestinian nationals are killed, and yet the UK and the US government still refuse to uh, uh, impose an arms embargo leaves me speechless. What do they say? We called in the Israeli ambassador. Their citizens have been killed and potentially by their own weapons and yet they refuse to suspend arms sales to Israel. It is astounding that, that we are at this point. Um, in terms of where what should be the role of the Palestinian diaspora community? That is very clear. They should be front and centre of all the work that is being done across the world 
speaking about their rights, their family's rights, the rights of their community. There is no doubt about that. And anyone that sidelines the voices of Palestinians and the interests of Palestinians should not be working towards this end. It is clear that they should be front and centre. But I would also say here as well that what we've heard continuously and we've experienced continuously is a weaponization of anti-Semitism to close down space across the world, across the world for the rights of Palestinians. And it should be very clear that anti-Semitism is egregious and it is something that we should all fight with everything that we have. But what we have seen is a weaponization of anti-Semitism and what we have heard from so many of our Jewish counterparts in the UK and across the world is that it's in fact not in their interests to have anti-Semitism weaponized because it, it undermines the real fight against anti-Semitism. To conflate the crimes of Israel with the Jewish people and the discrimination they face is wrong and harmful to fighting that discrimination. So why do I raise that? I raise that because some of the most important allies that we have are allies in the Jewish community. And their voices are so critical and we have some of those in the room today. And I wanna say thank you to you and to all those organizations in the UK. We have Na'amod and other organizations that we work closely with. Because without your voices, we cannot fight because of the overwhelming weaponization of anti-Semitism. I want to also call on and say that it's critical that the United Nations uses its role. And as has been spoken so eloquently by my co-panelist from South Africa, the United Nations spearheaded the work against anti-apartheid in South Africa. It is the role and it is the duty of the General Assembly and of the Special Committee to do the same with respect to Palestine and the occupied Palestinian territory. My last comment will be how important it has been, the work that has been done, to acknowledge the situation as the crime of apartheid. Because for the first time, I think that I can remember when there have been hostilities between Hamas and people in Gaza, for the first time, the UN, General, the UN Secretary General spoke about the root causes of the conflict. For the first time, the suffering of the Palestinian people has been contextualized. And that's why the work around exposing and ensuring we speak about the crimes of apartheid and persecution is so critical because it counters the decontextualization of the Palestinian suffering. And I think the work around apartheid is critical. And I, I really call on UN member states who are here today to take up that call and make sure we're doing everything we can to push the work around anti-apartheid in Palestine and the occupied Palestinian territories. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ahmed. I now give the floor to Mrs. Araf, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to be brief, so thank you to everyone who's made comments and questions. Um, and I apologize, I'm not uh, quite certain about what are the recommendations that Palestinian civil society have made in relation to a renewed special committee against apartheid, but just to take in the questions about corporate responsibility as well, it, I know that the special committee uh, also, you know, at the time, one of the functions was to review and report on third state responsibility. One of the things a renewed committee could do is also uh, review and, and uh, uh, report on the role and responsibility of corporations um, in relation to uh, the complicity around um, uh, complicity with Israeli crimes. Um, on the issue of targeted sanctions against corporations, I mean, other than supporting UN sanctions, there's all the autonomous sanctions that each state can and should be doing related to their targeted human rights sanctions laws. There's a number of states that have pursued and implemented Magnitsky-style 
uh, targeted human rights sanctions. Um, and civil society can make referrals. Obviously, it's very unfortunate that decisions themselves are still subject to foreign policy considerations and are at the discretion of uh, the particular governments. But I still think it might be a worthwhile pursuit for civil society to make recommendations in a multilateral fashion um, in, in the different jurisdictions that have these laws against, uh, you know, with very strategic targeted objectives um, um, in relation to corporations that are complicit with Israeli crimes. Um, uh, it's worked really well in relation to the situation in Myanmar. Um, my organisation ha has been involved in relation to making uh, referrals uh, uh, against corporations that are directly linked or associated with the junta in Myanmar and that has been successful in terms of the different jurisdictions around the world that have taken up that call and within their own um, autonomous sanctions regimes have imposed uh, sanctions against those corporations as well. Um, so that could be something that we could look to in terms of how uh, d different actors uh, approach that call. I know that we're looking at um, uh, financial institutions, banks, um, and other corporations that uh, that we could make referrals um, to in, in relation to, to Australia. So um, that's all I wanted to say on that front. I hope that was helpful, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Araf. Now I give the floor to Mrs. Rawi. You have the floor. Bueno. Uh, Yo diría que en el rol, en todo caso, o sea, precisando el rol de, de las comunidades de la diáspora palestina, sobre todo en América Latina y el Caribe, eh, yo debería tener la honestidad, o sea, tengo la honestidad de decir que en el caso argentino es una comunidad muy pequeña en relación al resto del, de los territorios que existen, como en Chile, Perú, Honduras, Brasil, etcétera, etcétera. Por lo tanto, eh, nuestro apoyo fundamental no es solamente, digamos, encontrarnos, que nos estamos reencontrando, el último censo que hemos hecho eh, ya ubica a más de 6.500 palestinos y palestinas en el territorio, incluidos muchos hermanos que han venido últimamente desde Gaza a partir del 2014 y otros, Y con, y con diferentes entradas, y eh, igual eso no significa que la amplificación, digamos, de volumen implique una comunidad eh, fortalecida, nos estamos fortaleciendo, eh, y es uno de los roles nuestros como comunidad, fortalecernos hacia adentro y también fortalecer los vínculos hacia la afuera, en este sentido, Siempre hemos tenido claro como Federación eh, Palestina de Argentina eh, que la sociedad civil, sus organizaciones, son nuestro respaldo concreto. Y por lo tanto trabajamos en conjunto, ya sea a niveles eh, políticos, sindicales, estudiantiles, académicos, eh, creando vínculos. La federación de alguna manera es la armadora de vínculos, por así decirlo, como para que, a, a concluir en acciones estratégicas. Ahora, con respecto, nosotros hemos tenido batallas, como dije en algún momento, como Mecorot en su momento que logramos paralizar un acuerdo espurio. Ahora, desgraciadamente, en estos últimos 10 años se ha ido modificando, digamos, el, el mapeo de lo que es la Argentina y también desde lo que llamaríamos, salvo excepciones, América Latina y el Caribe, con respecto a eso. Eh, tenemos en claro, o sea, Argentina sigue manteniendo vínculos con Palestina, pero no son vínculos muy profundos en este momento. Claramente el presidente Milley ha, ha declarado, inclusive ha propuesto, eh, cambiar la embajada de Tel Aviv a Jerusalén, cosa que se le va a complicar porque además eh, esto está hecho, es una ley ejecutada por el Congreso Nacional Argentino. Pero bueno... Tenemos a Paraguay con la misma intención, eh, tenemos el caso de, 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 de que se han, eh, Argentina 
hasta hace muy poco nunca se obtuvo en el Consejo de Derechos Humanos con respecto a Palestina. Hoy se obtuvo, es una buena señal dentro de todo, digamos, pero no la mejor. Eh, pero sí existen, por ejemplo, eh, el reconocimiento a la Alianza Internacional para el Recuerdo del Holocausto, el IRA, que es grave porque permite la penalización y persecución de la protesta o de las opiniones. Como ejemplo, tenemos un caso concreto, en la Argentina hace poco, hace unos ocho meses, eh, un argentino que adhiere a la causa palestina, se, en Facebook hizo un comentario eh, donde eh, decían, bueno, ustedes celebran Buenos Aires, eh, Israel, Buenos Aires celebra a Israel, y él dice, y no miran las masacres que, 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 que se cometen en Gaza en ese momento, antes del 7 de octubre. Bueno, este señor fue imputado directamente eh, por un funcionario de la Embajada de Israel y estuvo cerca de ocho meses preso. No hay concretamente, eh, puntualmente, alguna acción que, que permita que, que, que siga siendo imputado. Sin embargo, él está ahora con prisión domiciliaria, pero si lo analizamos, es muy parecido a lo que es la prisión administrativa que ejecuta el sionismo en Palestina. Lo pongo como ejemplo y se han dado otras situaciones también en contra de otros legisladores, del, pero que no avanzan por el poder en sí, entonces queda como parado. Pero se están dando estas situaciones en la Argentina. También paralelamente tengo que decir que a partir de las manifestaciones mesiánicas del presidente argentino, <coughs> Hemos ido avanzando, hemos ido avanzando sobre todo en el tema de lo que es <coughs> el tema justamente del BDS, el boicot de inversiones y sanciones, en tomas de conciencias, no de acciones, o sea, que puedan hoy decir, bueno, pero sí en toma de conciencia de las sociedades que hasta hace un tiempo nos decían, bueno, hablemos del tema del agua, hablemos de, 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 lo, que, de, de lo que significa, digamos, eh, que vengan empresas foráneas a ocupar el territorio, pero no hablemos de Israel. Hoy ya no soslayan a Israel, directamente saben quién es el responsable, quiénes cometen crímenes de guerra, quiénes ejercen el apartheid en Palestina. Saben, hoy lo saben, por lo tanto, esas personas que son más de 60 organizaciones que están tomando el tema a lo ancho y a lo largo, son replicadores. Está bien, diremos, ¿de qué nos sirve en estos momentos cuando existe un genocidio? Solamente nos sirve para que sean voces replicadoras pidiendo un alto al fuego, esa es la verdad. Yo no voy a venir a engañar acá y decir que en la Argentina estamos logrando dar un paso significativo, porque no es real. Es significativo en el sentido de que sí hay una toma de conciencia y un posicionamiento claro. Pero ¿cómo le torcemos el brazo a un gobierno que está decidido y que es cómplice? Y en eso sí tenemos en estos momentos conversaciones con la Asociación Americana de Juristas, justamente, para no solamente acusar a Netanyahu. Nosotros decimos que mi ley es culpable, tan culpable, por complicidad de genocidio. Sus acciones son eh, cómplices del genocidio en sí mismo. Entonces, desde ahí partimos. Y hay una sociedad que está dispuesta, y eso no es menor, pero desgraciadamente vuelvo a decir, porque me da mucha tristeza, yo entiendo y yo tengo la urgencia de que se paren los crímenes en Gaza, pero también entiendo y siento de que solamente a partir de la toma de conciencia reales se pueden modificar ciertas acciones. Por supuesto, desde acá vamos a pedir el fin de la ocupación, la colonización y la limpieza étnica pero tenemos que también ver 
y yo soy optimista en el sentido de que más temprano que tarde vamos a incidir en nuestros gobiernos, porque hay realidades diferentes. El caso de Colombia es uno, Brasil es otro, Venezuela, eh, Bolivia, Chile, pero hoy la Argentina realmente vive un retroceso que tiene también que ver con un retroceso regional. Por eso cuando hablo de acción estoy hablando también de los países de occidentales centrales que, que miran para el costado. Y bueno, desde allí, desde la humildad, lo digo honestamente, nosotros podemos trabajar y por supuesto bregar y adherirnos. Somos parte del BDS, somos parte también, hemos hecho pedido de informes con el embargo militar y tenemos un personaje muy siniestro en la Argentina que se llama Montoto, que viene ejecutando acciones de compra y venta de armas de terror. Hemos sacado libros, vamos a sacar otro nuevo nuevamente para hacer una presentación que lo ofreceremos en su momento vía internet con información, pero es lo que podemos hacer. Eh, desgraciadamente, o sea, y digo desgraciadamente porque me gustaría darles un informe mucho más optimista. Soy optimista hacia el futuro, soy convencida de que Palestina será libre. El tema es que esta emergencia, este horror que estamos viviendo, eh, a veces yo digo será, y lo quiero explicitar porque es, es muy terrible, o sea, digo, ¿qué estamos haciendo mal? para que muera tanta gente, perdón, pero es un genocidio, perdón. Gracias, gracias, Ravi. Eh, antes de darle la palabra al profesor para que vaya también cerrando, eh, ciertamente nos toca mucho el genocidio en Palestina, pero jamás la causa palestina, esto lo dijo el comandante Fidel Castro hace unos años, en el año 1979, jamás la causa palestina pareció más justa que en el, constante, en el contraste con la brutalidad repulsiva de sus adversarios. La humanidad no olvidará ni el heroísmo de los agredidos ni la barbarie de los agresores. En, entonces, eh, con la convicción de que Palestina será libre, independiente y soberana, le doy la palabra al profesor eh, Chicane, eh, para el cual se pinta la pregunta de la Parhey, que todavía eh, debemos responder antes de hacer las conclusiones finales del, del panel. Profesor, you, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um... Speaking last, it's an advantage because they answered all the questions. Uh, the only question that I didn't hear somebody talk about is expel Israel from the UN. I haven't heard anybody talking about it. I think we have a precedence in terms of what happened with South Africa. I think it reached a stage where it, its membership could not be sustainable and it was suspended. Uh, obviously, they walked out uh, banging the drums, but they were suspended and only returned after 94, uh, after the elections in 1994. So there's a basis on which if they um, defy all the international laws, then they can't be part of the uh, United Nations in that regard. Uh, but um, I think those who are specialized in the United Nations will know how to handle that. Um, the, I didn't refer to the ICJ action. You did refer to it, uh, Mr. Hijazi, uh, South Africa's action there because I thought it's well known, so I didn't really think we should talk about it. But it was a major development within South Africa. They were pro per pursuing the ICC route, and uh, it became clear there's a bo blockage there. Somebody's blocking. It's easy to get put in charge within a day. 
but you can go to the ICC now if it's not in the interest of those countries that matter. It will not happen. And that should have happened long ago. The, we suggested the whole cabinet, war cabinet, actually should be charged for crimes against humanity. I've not said anything from the ICC. So there's a problem within the ICC. In South African language, we say they are captured. You know, if you can't do what you are supposed to do, it means somebody has captured you not to do the things you're supposed to do. Uh, the rest of the other questions were answered. I just uh, want to say that on the committee, the special committee, I think we should have discussions about it. It was indeed specially for South Africa, 1962, I think, that resolution. We, we don't have to say we are reviving the resolution of South, about South Africa. It's a, we, we are asking for adoption of a resolution against apartheid. And uh, in this case, we can even generalize it beyond just Palestine, so that when you solve Palestine, you don't have another problem. You need to start all over again. But those who are experts, again, in the area would uh, do better to advise. Uh, the last thing I just want to say is that, you know, the, um, I am really concerned that Western countries, democracies, let me put it in that way, are allowing themselves to reverse the gains of democracy. Because if you want to hold unpopular views, you make sure your population is ignorant. So in South Africa, for instance, whites were made ignorant, didn't read even. If we are killed and detained, it doesn't go to the news. So whites co continued supporting the apartheid system. Even the leader of my church in the white section thought I was a terrorist until after 94, and he confessed that he didn't know what was happening. So now, if you've got a problem with Russia, you cut off the TV. So suddenly we can't watch TV. So <coughs> we rely on their views to influence us. And um, if I didn't have Al Jazeera, I wouldn't hear what's happening there. In fact, some of the Western TV networks uh, did not broadcast live the South African presentation, but broadcast live the Israeli response, which was so dramatic. And that tells you that democracy, that's, it's at risk. It's not just international law. It's democracy itself that it's at risk. And we are, we are rever peddling backwards into dictatorship. So I think those who come from those countries need to realize that actually this is detrimental to themselves. As I said with the Israeli soldiers, I mean, when you go through those checkpoints and you see these young people, they, they can't be normal. So you're producing an abnormal Israeli society uh, by <coughs> running a, a system like that. So I just want to add by saying, you know, there's this popular saying, do unto others as you would that they do to you. And I am convinced that member states of the United Nations would not tolerate the killing of their children the way in which children are killed in Gaza. And I think it's, a, it's not a question of debate. Thank you very much, Professor. With this answer, um, with, with, I just have a unique question that was not uh, answered. That was, what was uh, the neighbor countries, uh, what they were doing? Uh, so, um, at least I, ca I, I can say that um, there is a letter signed yesterday by the OIZ and also by the Arab group 
and the uh, non-alive movement all together, we join, uh, we sign a, a joint letter, um, and we address the letter to the Secretary General, to the President of the General Assembly, and also to the President of the Security Council, uh, asking for the admission of the State of Palestine, Palestine as a member state of the United Nations. So uh, we have to be focused on the struggle, uh, on the fight on, on, in April, and civil society have an important role to play, uh, making pressure on uh, those who have to decide finally if they are going to veto, whether they are going to veto uh, this uh, issue in the UN Security Council in April. So with that, uh, we conclude our deliberation of Plenary 2. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank, for, uh, to thank you for all the participation and contribution to the discussions. Please know that uh, we will resume tomorrow the conference at 10 a.m. for Plenary 3 on the issue of state actions on accountability, discussing best practices, Follow in the afternoon by Plenary 4 on ensuring compliance with international mechanism after the ICG rulings. So I thank also all the panelists that has accompanied us uh, this afternoon, and I take the opportunity as well to uh, thank the uh, interpreters for their excellent job uh, this afternoon. With that, uh, we hope to see you all tomorrow, and the meeting is adjourned.